welcome to this episode of Tales of the Resistance, your one-stop shop for all things antimicrobial resistance. I'm Mara Zelt, and I am the project manager at the I'm Responsible Project, and I'm joined today by Amber Patterson. Hi, I'm Amber. I work on the I Am Responsible team as the graphic designer and communications person. Looking forward to the podcast. Okay, so today on the pod, we're welcoming Noelle Moray, who is just recently finished defending her PhD dissertation here at the University of Nebraska. Congratulations to Noelle, um, now doctor. Um, she did her PhD in the Department of Civil Engineering here, looking at um, ways to intervene in waste management practices, specifically in agriculture, to reduce antimicrobial resistance that could possibly move into the environment um, from the waste to environmental um, pathway. So we're excited to hear from her as a uh, new professional in this space and see what her perspective is on what AMR, what working in, in AMR is going to be looking like for the next 30, 40, 50 years. So, all right, let's get into it. So I'll just have us start the conversation with asking you to introduce yourself and in your words, kind of tell us what you do related to antimicrobial resistance or have done up to this point. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for having me. My name is Noel Atieno Moire, and I, I recently received my PhD or defended my PhD dissertation at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. My dissertation mainly evaluated mitigation strategies for antimicrobial resistance, majorly in agricultural environment. So from beef cattle feedlots and manure coming from beef cattle feedlots to application of swine manure slurry. And so that's what I do in relation to antimicrobial resistance is to look at methods in which we can use to mitigate antimicrobial resistant bacteria and antimicrobial resistant genes in animal manure through either physical, biological, or chemical methods. That's a great uh, short summary of what was in fact, what, six years <laughs> of work <laughs> or something like that. So uh Good on you for the <laughs> conciseness. I did particularly want to ask you, Noel, to join the podcast because you are, I mean, part of the podcast is about talking about our own personal stories and experiences with antimicrobial resistance, and you are a big part of mine. We both started <laughs> our research on antimicrobial resistance together, yes. um, working in the same uh, research team and some of the yes. same topics. So as I was thinking about, you know, that, I got to thinking about how our journeys can start, you know, the different yeah. places that we come to antimicrobial resistance. So I wonder if you would share with our audience, maybe how you first learned about the topic, what drew you to it, um, if anything, <laughs> you know, like if maybe it was just, I got to sign this, but, you know, how did you first <laughs> learn about it? And, and what got you first engaged? Yeah, that's funny because most uh, graduate students start off and be like, okay, I think I need money, I need an assistantship, and this seems like it. But from an international perspective, and I'm mostly talking here as someone who hails from Africa, I come from Kenya, and growing up, say, you have a headache, they'll give you a moxilin, and you can get that over the counter easy. You know, medicine is not antibiotic specifically and not prescribed in such a strict manner as it is in the developed countries already. And so you can easily get access to antibiotics by easily going over the counter uh, without any doctor's prescription. And so that kind of plays a big role, not only in terms of antibiotic resistance, but also just having the different uh, regions and different access to these amenities. And so coming from that perspective, uh, antimicrobial resistance is definitely a big challenge. 
especially in the developing countries. And one issue may be the poverty or the lack of access to health amenities and basic sanitation, because this ones would definitely drive up the disease factor. But then we have unregulated drug supply chains or even improper diagnostics or even just the spread of infectious diseases that is so much rampant, like malaria is a big challenge in, um, in, in Kenya per se, but in America, that's not a case. Like you'll even go to a hospital coming from Africa with a malaria disease and they don't know what to do with you, you know? And so having these issues uh, that creates a global public health threat, mostly because of the economic considerations. And uh, because of that, and so, yes, it is true that antimicrobial resistance faces developing countries in, uh, in a harsh way compared to other countries, but I feel with more research and more education, there may be better ways in which we can help control antimicrobial resistance even in the developing countries just as much as it is in already developed countries. And there are very, very many research topics that I would love to explore on that front, but uh, that means uh, I would need to get funding and also get to work with other experts on that note. But yeah, that's one thing that's very close to my heart. But as a sort of new professional with expertise in antimicrobial resistance, mm -hmm. do you have thoughts on what a career in antimicrobial resistance research could look like? Um, yeah, um, I think I have some thoughts on that. And, uh, but also just being in the career for, say, five years, which has helped me open my eyes, um, Dr. Emmy Schmidt and others of us looked at the communication aspect of it. Uh, mostly because antimicrobial resistance is that big thing that uh, divides the health sector from the agriculture sector, people thinking which way or who is the most contributor to antimicrobial resistant in the resistance in the environment, right? And so we looked at ways that we can disseminate that information to both stakeholder farmers and also the health industry and telling them no one is at fault here, no one is evil here, but just look at these methods in which you can easily communicate to people and help, uh, help pass the information forward. So uh, communication is one bit that can be looked at. And uh, another way that the research in antimicrobial resistance can grow, I do not have any expertise in this, but I am very, very much interested in it, is the quantitative microbial risk assessment. And so with that, we're looking at antimicrobial resistance as a risk factor, and then say it's coming from either the agricultural side or the health side, how does it get to the public health? And so doing a quantitative microbial risk assessment would help in order to determine, say, better mitigation strategies or which interventions would work better than the others and also just a means to communicate uh, the effect of antimicrobial resistance to the environment, uh, to the public health and ways in which we can better intervene and mitigate that. Um, so that's the second bit. And then the other bit, uh, there's been a lot of research say over the past six, 10 years on antimicrobial resistance. But also with time, this tends to grow. A lot of growth means there's a lot of data currently. I guess one, one future research would be how to possibly with all this data, having a database where you don't have to be repeating what someone else has done, but just build up on the research by say, doing more metadata is it nearly necessary? What if someone did a similar study? Uh, but you can also use that data, say, to do some other sort of analysis. And so I feel like there's a lot of growth, both in research uh, and also in communication and also just further data analysis in terms of antimicrobial resistance. And yeah, I guess another spiel that I'll probably like to look into is in the correlation of antimicrobial resistance as an emerging contaminant 
and other emerging contaminants within the environment, microplastics being big at the moment. So looking at that cofactor analysis where there's both presence of antimicrobial resistance and microplastics and how does that affect the environment? How does that affect the microbial community? And how does that eventually impact the public health? Wow, you got a lot of ideas. I guess that's what, you, that's what happens you know, when you come right out of your PhD. I mean, that's right. what they ask you to do. What is going to be, <laughs> what is going to be the future? I love the the things you said about first uh, the risk um, assessment. I think, mm -hmm. and I've kind of established myself in this series already. I'm a bit of a nerd about context um, systems, and I think that that is really important part of telling that story how mm -hmm. does or we were talking about the cofactor analysis how does one environmental pollutant impact antimicrobial resistance how are those pollutants moving through all of these complex biological and environmental systems mm -hmm. and but also that important piece of context in the risk assessment which is is this something you need to be fearful of, you know, or yeah. what can you give yourself some tools to mitigate the, um, your risks, you know? Yeah. That's something that that kind of approach can give all of us as researchers and as communicators, which I think is going to be super helpful in a problem this big, you know, mm -hmm. and to make her resistance as we always say with the I am responsible team is we all have a role. <laughs> so <laughs> everybody is going to have to do something and yes. being able to identify what is the best thing yeah. for anyone and to do. Yeah, I do agree that uh, microbial risk assessment will possibly be the best way to determine how that plays a role because it's not only in say one area of expertise, it, one model or one risk model can be manipulated to look at different environmental factors or different sources of antimicrobial resistance, you know? And so that way that can also play a big role in communication or in also getting the tools as you just, as you've mentioned, yeah. Yeah, I, I really, and for our listeners who don't know, so one of the, the gals here at University of Nebraska who Noelle and I have worked with, Dr. Bing Wang, she's a quantitative risk assessment uh, sort yes. of expert. And I think I've listened to her speak on this many times and I'm always inspired and maybe I need a career change or something. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah. And with that, I think I'm going to ask you one last question to close us out. And that is to look again, kind of looking towards the future. You know, we get this number that 2050, 10 million deaths a year, you know, and that's going to be within our working lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on like, are you, are how hopeful you are or how concerned do you think we can sort of meet the challenge as, as a whole? Um, or where do you think would be the biggest um, issue that we're going to have to address? Uh, within the next 30 years uh, working in antimicrobial resistance? Yeah, that's a, that's a big number and it's scary, right? <laughs> it is scary to know that uh, the effects that antimicrobial resistance has. And in as much as it is big, I feel like people should be scared, but also take action. And one approach would be in the one health perspective, whereby I think I, I am, I is also best on that, uh, within the one health where people within different aspects of antimicrobial resistance or where it affects come to work together. So not just researchers in say uh, academia work uh, away from those people who work in the health industry, but coming to work together, that would be the best way to go about it. And that's because not only the researchers would learn from that, but also that would give a uh, one vocal language whereby we do tell the people, this is the problem. 
And this is how we are working on it together. And this is where you come in to help reduce or help promote the best practices to slow down uh, AMR and also to reduce the levels of AMR. And so, yes, we should be scared, but yes, I am hopeful that if we do take action, we'll be able to meet the numbers that the World Health Organization or the CDC have set out for us. Yeah. It's good to start to end on a, on a hopeful note. So we yes. look forward to what you're doing in the future. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Mara. Thank you thank so you, much. Noel. Thank you. All right, that was great. I, I don't wanna be biased here, but I think that might've been my favorite so far. I don't know if it was just the specific field or just how, how like really passionate about uh, passionate about AMR uh, we got into. So that was super, super interesting. Yeah, it was definitely uh, an eye opener. I really enjoyed this episode. I learned a lot. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, next week, we're going to take a little bit of a jag because we're going to have Dr. Divya Gironi in from Oklahoma State University. She's She does a little bit with animals in terms of She's talking about foods of animal origins, but she's more on the food safety side. So we're going to get into some real microbiology with her, and I'm looking forward to it. So we'll look forward to that conversation next week and talk to you all again soon.